This is a 2D model of an eye. This first video I'll be going over all the ocular adnexa, uh, which are all the outer parts of the eye, like the eyelids, the extrinsic muscles, the conjunctiva, things like that. And in the second video I'll go over the actual globe of the eye and all the inside parts. Uh, so this is just a generic domestic animal. Um, since it's got a round pupil, I guess we can call it a dog. Uh, first thing we're going to look at are the eyelids, or the palpebrae. Um, they're right here. There are two mobile folds of skin found on both eyes. Uh, they protect the anterior portion of the eye. And they are lined with conjunctiva. So if I were to remove the eyelids, like that, then you could see all these mucous membranes right here. These are all conjunctiva. conjunctiva. So the conjunctiva are rich in mucous glands, lymphocytes, nerves, and blood vessels. And they are a blind sac. So even though it runs around the entire anterior portion of the eye, I left dotted lines right here so you could see the inside. And they're blind sacs. It's one fold of skin right here and right here on the bottom. So if you get dirt or debris or like a contact lens or something like that up underneath the eyelid, it can't go back to the posterior portion of the eyeball. It won't get behind your eye. It is impossible. And this little triangular piece of skin right here, this is the third eyelid or the nictitating membrane and it's found in most domestic animals but not in humans and it's a t-shaped piece of cartilage uh, that's covered in conjunctiva and it moves diagonally across the eyeball when an animal blinks so if they get like a piece of grit or sand something stuck in there then they get a very distinct scratching pattern across the cornea and the conjunctiva is part of the lacrimal apparatus which I'll pull up in just a second. There it is. So in order to keep the eye moist, the uh, lacrimal gland, which is just above the eye, will secrete tears. And there's also a gland in the third eyelid that provides secretions to help keep it moist. And so all this moisture and water washes across the eye and it's collected in the folds of the conjunctiva and it drains out of these tiny little holes in the medial corner of the eye, and they're called the lacrimal puncta. Puncta is plural, uh, punctum is singular. So there's the superior lacrimal punctum on top and the inferior on the bottom. And these two canals meet at the lacrimal sac. And all this water drains through the lacrimal sac and continues down through the nasolacrimal duct all the way to the nose. And this is why when you cry, you tend to get like a bit of a watery nose and this is how animals with moist noses, like dogs, uh, keep the moisture in their nose. Um, all the water from the eye travels down the nasolacrimal duct, comes out and keeps their nose wet. And this is actually a diagram for the lacrimal apparatus of a right eye, because this is the medial corner, and this would be the lateral corner. So I will pull up the eyelids and show you what it looks like on the left eye. So the lacrimal gland would be right here and the tears would come down towards the eye and wash across the eye diagonally and they would drain through the inferior lacrimal punctum and the superior lacrimal punctum and continue through the nasolacrimal duct. So the next thing we're going to look at are the extrinsic muscles of the eye. So let me take the eyelids back off and then we will remove the third eyelid and the conjunctiva and now we're going to look at the muscles so this first muscle right up here is the levator palpebrae superioris I'm going to take a minute to spell that out uh, superioris and palpebrae is another word for eyelid so this muscle allows you to raise your upper eyelid and underneath that are the two oblique muscles. There's the dorsal oblique up here, 
and down here is the ventral oblique and they put tension in opposite directions on your eyeball to keep it from spinning on its axis. Um, so if the axis runs lengthwise it keeps it from you know, spinning to the left or spinning back up to the right so it doesn't rotate in its socket. And underneath the obliques are the four rectus muscles. So this is the rectus dorsalis on top, the rectus ventralis on the bottom. Since this is, this is the left eye, then this is the lateral side. So this is the rectus lateralis. And way back here is the rectus medialis. And once we get rid of those four muscles, and take the medialis off in the back, then we're left with the globe of the eye. This is the second video on the eye model. Uh, now we're going to be looking at the globe of the eye and all the inside parts. So the globe of the eye has three layers to it, or tunics. There's the fibrous tunic, the vascular tunic underneath that, and then the deepest tunic is the nervous tunic. So right here we're looking at the fibrous tunic. Um, it's a very uh, tough outer shell almost. Um, it provides structure and support for the other two tunics. And it's got two parts to it. There's the transparent cornea and the opaque sclera. And it's usually grayish, maybe sometimes a little bit of bluish tint to it, but it's opaque. And the cornea has several layers to it. Five, actually. Um, there's the epithelium, which is the outermost layer. That's where most of the nerve endings terminate. Underneath that is the Bowman's layer, which is made of collagen. And the third layer down is the stroma. And that's about 90% of the thickness of the cornea. And there's a lot of uh, water in the membrane and these collagen fibers. And underneath the stroma is a decimus membrane, which is secreted by the endothelium. And the endothelium also has the important job of removing excess water from the stroma through ion exchange. So if anything happens to the endothelium, like it becomes damaged through diabetes, um, then all this water will continue building up in the stroma and eventually the entire layer will become opaque and this causes blindness. So it's very important that the endothelium not be damaged. Um, so the next tunic underneath the fibrous tunic is the vascular tunic. And the only portion of the vascular tunic that's visible uh, from this view is the iris. The iris is a pigmented sphincter of muscle. Um, you usually get blue, green, uh, most likely brown pigments. And it's got two types of smooth muscle in there. They run, or sorry, they run in two directions rather, instead of two types. But there's the pupillary dilators, uh, which run radially out this way, and the pupillary constrictors, which run around. And the muscles pretty much do exactly what they say they do. Uh, the constrictors will constrict the pupil. Uh, pupil is the hole in the center of the iris, this dark area right here. Uh, so the constrictors will constrict the pupil and reduce the amount of light coming into the eye. And the dilators will dilate the pupil out and allow more light to come into the eye. Alright, so if we were to cut into the fibrous tunic and just slice right through the cornea and the sclera, then this is what we would see on the inside. This is the aqueous humor, and this is the vitreous humor. Uh, they're both acellular uh, like gel, they're very fluid, very squishy, and um, they nourish different parts of the eye because some areas don't have blood vessels like the cornea 
has no blood vessels running through it because it's transparent, so it gets most of its nourishment from the aqueous humor. And the aqueous humor runs from the cornea to the lens, and this is the lens right in here. And the vitreous humor runs from the lens to the retina. So if we were to kind of just suck this gel out, remove the aqueous humor and the vitreous humor, then this is what we would see underneath. Uh, these muscles right here are the iris. I left them red just so you could see that they were muscles, uh, even though we had a blue iris earlier. But this space right here in the middle, that would be the pupil. And this is, again, part of the vascular tunic. And the other part of the vascular tunic is the ciliary body. These little things right here, and it runs all the way around. And again, right here. So the ciliary body has two very important functions. One is that it has capillaries uh, that produce the aqueous humor. And the second is that it provides attachment points right here for the suspensory ligaments of the lens. And the ciliary body, is it's actually a muscle. So when these muscles contract, they pull the suspensory ligaments with them. And if they contract, they'll tighten the ligaments and this can flatten the lens. And that's how you change the focal distance in your eye. And if we remove the iris muscles and the ciliary body, then what we're left with are the suspensory ligaments and the lens. So the lens has a couple different layers to it. Um, this diagram is actually sideways. So this is the anterior portion of the lens right here. It's analogous to this side. Uh, it's made of dead, transparent cells. Uh, the oldest cells are in the middle, while the newer cells are constantly being added to the outside. And they're packed in very tightly. Uh, so the lens is a, it's a very hard, biconvex disc. And it's surrounded by a lens capsule, which is secreted by the epithelium, which is a layer of simple cuboidal cells on the anterior portion of the lens. So they'll be right along here. And if we take the lens off, then we can see the final part of the vascular tunic right here. That's the choroid. And we'll come back to that in a minute. So sitting just on top of the choroid is the retina, also known as the nervous tunic. And this is a very thin membrane. It's light sensitive. And this is how you actually see objects. This is what allows you to see. So if something happens to your retina, then you will go blind. Um, it contains several types of neurons. So pull these up. So there's the actual light sensitive neurons, the rods and cones, the bipolar neurons, which are just under those, and then the ganglion. So how they work is that light comes in to the front of the eye. This is the cornea over here. And it passes all the way through, excites the rods and cones, and they send a stimulus down through the bipolar neurons and then to the ganglion neurons. And the ganglion neurons have axons which form the optic nerve. And that sends a signal to the brain. So, if you've dissected the eye in lab, uh, you'll know that the retina is very easy to peel off. Oops. So, it's very flimsy. If we peel it off, then we're left with choroid, which is the other part of the vascular tunic. And the choroid is its a thin, dark membrane it's highly vascular, uh, hence the name vascular tunic. Uh, there's just so many blood vessels running throughout uh, because it supplies the retina with blood. The retina does not have any vessels in it. And this shiny part 
of the choroid is called the tapetum lucidum, and it enhances vision uh, for in low light. And what it does is basically the light will come in and bounce off the tapetum lucidum and head back into the retina for a second time. And I pull these up so I can show you what it does. So these are the neurons with the photoreceptors. So the light will come in through the cornea, excite the photoreceptors, hit the tapetum lucidum, bounce off back, and excite the photoreceptors again for a second time. So essentially what it's doing is it's allowing the animal to recycle the light. This is very useful for uh, night vision. So cats uh, especially have a very large shiny tapetum lucidum. Dogs too. Uh, pigs and primates do not have one. Um, so humans just have a choroid. And that's why during like flash photography uh, we get red eye pictures because all the light is absorbed by the choroid and all you can see is red color. And that's also why dogs and cats, since they have the tapetum lucidum, uh, if the flash hits their eyes in the right way, they'll get these green glowy eyes in the picture. And if we were to peel off the choroid, we'd come back once again to the other side of the fibrous tunic with the cornea and the sclera. And that's all for the 2D model of the eye. Hopefully that helps your understanding of the anatomy. Um, I'm going to attach the file of the eye model along with these two videos. So if you have a program that allows you to manipulate layers, uh, such as GIMP, uh, this one's free, or Photoshop, which is what I'm using, then you can play around with all these layers and see where everything fits. Like you can put the muscles back on and things like that. So, hope that helped.